If you have osteoporosis, it's been drilled into you that you need to be eating calcium rich foods and possibly taking calcium supplements in order to reverse your osteoporosis and reduce your fractures. But is that really true? That's exactly what we're going to cover in this video. Here's what you can expect to learn. First, where did the RDA come from? Chances are, if you're a person with osteoporosis, you've been told that you need somewhere around 1200 milligrams of calcium per day. But where did that number come from? We'll cover that in this presentation. Then we'll talk about whether calcium actually reduces fracture risk, not just increases bone density, but reduces fracture risk, which is what really matters. After that, we're going to talk about the two most important nutrients to reduce fracture risk and hint, it's probably not what you think. And lastly, the best food sources of those nutrients so that you can know exactly what foods to eat in order to decrease your fracture risk and not just increase bone density. Now, before moving on, if you guys uh, want more videos about osteoporosis and overall health, click like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release more videos. Before we get there, to the good stuff, who am I to be, even be talking about this? Well, my name is Igor. I'm the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Osteoporosis Reversal Secrets. As well, I am, I am the CEO of an online and in-person personal training company that specializes in reversing osteoporosis. And I'm a real world personal trainer. I'm not just a YouTuber who, who makes videos about osteoporosis, but I'm a real life personal trainer who helps clients reverse osteoporosis like these two ladies and others. On the left is Darlene, uh, who di got diagnosed with breast cancer. And as a result um, of treatments and estrogen blockers, she lost a lot of bone density uh, to the point where she was on the verge of osteoporosis and she was able to turn that around. On the right is Laura, who lives in Los Angeles and she had severe osteoporosis and she was able to turn that around with a bunch of what you're going to learn in this presentation in particular. So now let's get to it. Where did the RDA of 1200 milligrams come from? Well, it's a very simple thing. During World War II in the 1940s, uh, the government looked at the nutrient intakes of apparently healthy people, and they saw how much of each nutrient do they consume. Sounds pretty sensible, sounds like the right thing to do, but there are really two problems with this. Problem number one is that they didn't compare the calcium consumption of healthy people to osteoporotic people. After all, what if both healthy people and osteoporotic people have the same calcium consumption? So calcium might not be the difference between osteoporosis and not osteoporosis. So that is problem number one. Problem number two with this is that they didn't even state where they got the number 1200 milligrams from. So here is the website, the National Institutes of Health, and the, this is where they recommend 1200 milligrams of calcium for people, for men and women over 70. However, if you look at the research, uh, their own research, their own study, if you scroll through all of this, here are the references, Nowhere do they state where that number, 1,200 milligrams, comes from. So how do they find it? They don't even disclose that. How interesting. Now, moving on, um, in one study from, from you know, the National Institutes of Health, they stated that supplementation with both calcium and vitamin D or consumption of dairy products fortified with both nutrients increased total BMD, however, bone mineral, mineral density. However, they go on to say that in subgroup analyses, calcium had no effect on femoral neck bone mineral density. The femoral neck is where the thigh meets the hip. Um, so it's interesting that not, not all parts of the body improve their bone density with calcium and vitamin D. How interesting. Now, does calcium really reduce fracturous? Because here they were just talking about bone density. Bone density helps predict fracturous, and it's a good test, but it's not a perfect test. The real test here is fracturous. After all, why do we want to hide bone density? Not just to look on a test, we just want to not fracture anything. So fracture risk is what really matters. And does calcium really reduce fracture risk? Well, according to the National Institutes of Health, here's what they say. For the most part, the observational evidence does not show that increasing calcium intakes reduces the risk of fractures and falls in older adults. How interesting. So this is a government document stating that yes, calcium increases bone density, but does not reduce fracture risk. Here is one study where researchers actually looked at fracture risk and not just bone density. What they did in this study 
is they divided participants into four different groups. One group of people consumed less than 400 milligrams of calcium per day. A second group of people consumed between 400 and 800 milligrams of calcium. The third group consumed between 800 and 1200, and a fourth group consumed more than 1200 milligrams of calcium per day. So very different uh, amounts of calcium consumption, but there was one commonality between them. There were no differences in fractures. In other words, whether they consumed a little bit of calcium or a lot of calcium, the risk of fractures was the same. Here's another study that backs up the same thing, or the rather meta-analysis. And here's what they state. We conclude that a self-reported low intake of milk is not associated with any marked increase in fracture risk. How interesting. What's going on here? Moving on, um, here is another meta-analysis that shows no reduction in hip fracture risk with calcium supplementation. So it's not just dietary calcium, it's also calcium supplements. Yes, they increase bone density a little bit, not a lot, but they don't actually reduce fracture risk. How interesting. Now, a lot of people will say, no, vegetables. Vegetables are what helps reduce fractures because they are a rich source of calcium. First of all, no, they are not a rich source of calcium. And check the video in the description uh, for a full elaboration on that. And second of all, they don't even reduce fracture risk at all. So here's some proof of that. In one meta-analysis titled Fruit and Vegetable Intake and Bones, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Here's what they did. They tried to figure out do fruits and vegetables reduce fracture risk? And what they did is they divided people into two categories. Those who had a high consumption of fruits and vegetables, and high consumption means six servings per day or more, and those who had a very low consumption of fruits and vegetables, two servings per day or less. Both were followed up for a very nice long period of time, for 8.1 years, um, and it had a very nice sample size. In the high uh, fruit and vegetable intake group, there were 20,000 people. In the low group, there were 29,000 people. And despite the vast differences in the fruit and vegetable intake, there was, again, one commonality, no difference in fracture risk. The high fruit and vegetable group, they had about 0.011% uh, number of fractures. And in the low, uh, low fruit and vegetable group, um, they had 0.0097%, which is virtually identical. In other words, vegetables and fruits do not reduce fracture risk. That's not to say they're not good for you. They are absolutely very good for you. I sing their praises in many of my other books, like High Blood Pressure Reversal Secrets, like Type 2 Diabetes Reversal Secrets. But one thing that they don't do is that they don't strengthen bones and they don't reduce fracture risk. And so why doesn't dietary or supplemental calcium decrease fracture risk? After all, aren't bones made of calcium? Well, here's the, here's the full story. Uh, yes, bones are made of calcium, but there's other things that they're made of. So there are 11 different minerals that make up bone. Furthermore, minerals only make up about 40% of bone. So let me ask you, imagine that you are baking a cake for five people. Last minute, each one of those five people tells you that they're bringing an extra guest to your party. So now you have 10 guests coming to you. Do you expect to double the flour and have double the cake? Well, no, you need to double every ingredient. Uh, same thing with calcium. You can't just increase calcium and expect a lower fracture risk. You need to increase other things, uh, nutrition in general, better food in general. Um, furthermore, again, uh, calcium is a mineral and minerals only make up 40% of bone. Well, what about the other 60%? The other 60% are made of protein, namely collagen. Collagen is a protein. And so you can't just focus on the minerals. You should because they make up a chunk of it, but you also need to focus on protein. And that's kind of a clue that if calcium isn't the way to stronger bones, what is? This brings us to the two most important nutrients when it comes to actual fracture risk, not just bone density. Yes, they both increase bone density, but more importantly, they reduce fracture risk. And those two are protein and vitamin K. Those are the two most powerful nutrients when it comes to fracture risk reduction. And so people ask, does protein really reduce fracture risk? Well, here is a study that backs this up. Um, in this study, what people, what the researchers did is they divided participants into four different groups. Group number one, less than 16% of their daily calories came from protein. Group number two, between 16 to 18% of their daily calories came from protein. Group number three, between 18 and 20% of their calories came from protein. And group number four, 
18 to 20% of their calories came from protein. And in this study, what I like about it is they actually measured fractures, not just bone density. In group number one, they experienced 16 hip fractures over the duration of the study. Group number two, 16 hip fractures as well. Group number three, seven hip fractures. So they had a big drop there. And group number four, five hip fractures. What does that tell us? That an adequate protein intake reduces fracture risk by more than 65%. Very, very powerful. Here's another study about uh, dietary protein and, and risk of osteoporotic hip fracture. And here is what they found. They analyzed 2,501 people between ages 50 and 89, and they were divided into different groups based on their protein, protein intake. And what they found is that the highest protein group, they had, they had a 65% lower risk of fractures compared to average. This is not even compared to the lowest protein group, compared to average, okay? And in the, the highest protein group, protein made up 30% of their daily calories, okay? So there is substantial evidence and very um, promising evidence that protein and vitamin K are really the keys to reducing fracture risk as well as improving bone density. What calcium does is it increases bone density without decreasing fracture risk. What protein does is it increases bone density and reduces fracture risk. And so the next question comes as, well, how much protein do I need? And so protein requirements depend on, well, three different factors. One is your activity levels, two is your age, and three is your body weight. And so let's break this down. If you're sedentary and under the age of 60, you need between 0 0.8 and 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. If you're over the age of 60, you need between 1.2 and 1.8 grams per kilogram per day. If all you're doing is cardio and you're under 60, you need between 1.2 and 1.4 grams per kilogram per day. If you're over 60, you need between 1.8 and 2.1 grams per kilogram per day. If you're a strength training only, uh, you need between 1.6 and 1.8 grams per kilogram per, per day if you're under 60. If you're over 60, you need between 2.4 and 2.7. And it's the same if you're doing cardio and strength training, okay? And so if you're wondering why do people over 60 need, need more protein people under 60, it's because their digestion is not as good as for people under 60. So their so so their absorption is not as good. They're not able to extract as much protein out of the food they are that they are eating. So they need more of it. Now, if all these numbers are confusing to you and you just want to know, bottom line, tell me what I need um, in terms of protein consumption. How much do I specifically need per day? I've made it very very simple for you. Just visit this link, this calculator that I've prepared for you. Um, which is also in the description below that you can just plug in your details, your age, your uh, weight and your activity levels, and it'll tell you the actual number of grams that you specifically need to get in your day. And so if you're wondering, now that I know how much I need, well, what contains protein? What are the best protein sources? Bar none, here are the best protein sources, meat, fish, seafood, protein powder. Those are bar none, what I call grade A protein. To become grade A protein, something, a food needs to have over 30 grams of protein per serving. Nothing else is grade A protein. Grade B protein, I would classify that as things with between 10 and 30 grams of protein per serving. So things like a cup of chickpeas, a cup of Greek yogurt, a cup of lentils, a cup of beans, all of those have very similar protein content at about 12 to 14 grams per serving, per cup, okay? And then there's what I call grade C protein. This is stuff that people often say has protein, but it's not a good source. A lot of people confuse the uh, confuse it has protein versus it has a lot of protein. So a lot of things have some protein, but not very much. For example, um, here, here are all categories of grade C protein. So most cheeses um, have about four to six grams per serving. And most eggs, uh, a medium-sized egg has six grams per serving. Milk, a cup of milk has nine grams of protein. Vegetables are very low in protein between one and three grams. And nuts, a handful of nuts will only have somewhere around six to eight grams of protein. Now, these are not bad foods. These are very good foods. I'm not saying don't eat them. I'm just saying don't expect to, to easily fill up your protein requirements with grade C protein. Now, of course, if you have two eggs, you make it grade B protein. If you have two slices of cheese, it becomes a grade B protein, etc. So you can have multiple servings, 
uh, of grade C protein to make grade B protein. You can have multiple servings of grade B protein to make grade A protein, or you can just have grade A protein. Um, now, if you're wondering what about this food or what about that food, um, you can actually look up additional protein sources um, at the same website, which is linked in the description. Um, and it'll tell you, let's say you want to know about specifically cashews or almonds or anything else. Um, you can actually type in the name of the food into this tool that's on this website, and it'll tell you how much protein that uh, that food contains, in addition to calories and other you know, nutrition and nutritional information. And lastly, vitamin K, as we spoke about, is the second most important nutrient when it comes to fracture risk. And here are your best sources of vitamin K. If you're wondering how much vitamin K do I need, it's about 15 micrograms per day. And again, these are the best sources. Eel, um, 100 grams of eel contain 63 micrograms of vitamin K. One egg yolk contains 67 micrograms, which is a very, very rich source of vitamin K. Cheese, especially Parmesan cheese, is the richest uh, source of vitamin K of the cheeses, uh, whereas other cheeses have less, but still all are pretty good. Prunes are very highly studied in research, and they contain 46 micrograms per 100 grams. 100 grams of prunes is about six prunes. Beef liver contains about 11 micrograms per 100 grams. And chicken, 100 grams of chicken, which is less than four ounces, contains 10 micrograms uh, of vitamin K. I hope you found this presentation beneficial. If you did, please click like, subscribe, and share with others.